Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Think Great Experience. I am very excited today because our guest is going to allow me to talk about two things I'm very passionate about, filmmaking and veterans and some other amazing topics. But I have had the privilege of being introduced to, to Frederick Marx, who is a producer, a director, a screenwriter, an editor, an Oscar-nominated editor, by the way, and has worked on some amazing projects and doing some things that are coming up um, that are just absolutely mind-blowing. And so it is just with the greatest level of enthusiasm and respect that I wanted to welcome you to the show, Frederick. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Eric. Really appreciate it. I'm enjoying uh, I'm, I'm looking forward very much to our conversation. Well, you know, you, you followed a, a career path <clears throat> that I was intended to go down. In fact, when you made the film Hoop Dreams, and, and, and that was released in 1994, I had just started at USC's film school that year. So, and I'm, a, I'm hugely passionate about the documentary film world. Um, but can you just share a little bit? You have decades of experience in filmmaking. And, and have, have worked on some amazing projects. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you started that, that journey of greatness into the world of filmmaking? You know, it's interesting. It's only with perfect hindsight that I began to understand my path as one that uh, uh, Joseph Campbell had described as following my bliss. So, you know, I was an undergraduate at the University of Illinois, having no clue what I wanted to do with my life. And I was thumbing through the course catalog and I ran across a film course. And this was a film appreciation course. So that's where it all started for me. Uh, and, you know, cut to four and a half years later, you know, I graduated, I had a double major, I, I barely squeaked by with my poli sci requirements. And I had like three times the requirements for a film degree. So, uh, so my first career choice was actually to be a film critic. Uh, and then also to be an academic, actually, like my parents, wow. Both of my parents were basically professors. So again, cut to, a, uh, you know, to, to the chase here. And in graduate school, I finally discovered filmmaking. And once yeah. I did, I was like, oh my God, what could possibly be more fun? And I've been doing it now for close to 50 years. Wow. I mean, you got bit by the bug. <laughs> oh, totally. I, um, I know for me, filmmaking was just, it was such a phenomenal way to tell stories and to share messages with people that I, I fell in love with it. Obviously, you know, kind of being a teenager in the 80s, you know, we went to see all the, the hot 80s movies and they were they were just cranking them out back then. There was 10 new movies a weekend, you know, so there was no shortage of movies to see. And then I I got bit by the bug actually right before I went into the Marine Corps. So before going in the Marines, I I knew that when I got out, I wanted to pursue, use my GI Bill, go to film school and pursue a career in film. And uh, I was very fortunate. I took film classes at the Orange, Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California, and had plenty of film appreciation uh, courses, you know. And you know what's the interesting thing about the uh, film appreciation or film history is, in those courses they make you watch movies that you may not necessarily voluntarily watch on your own, and you really do develop an appreciation. Because you know, I came out of, I went into film school in '91, so I I was Terminator Two was in the theater and and, and all those great movies and. And then they're telling me to watch Citizen Kane and, you know, these movies. And I remember not wanting to watch Citizen Kane at first. And then I watched it and I was I was blown away at the storytelling. And then I watched a documentary also. This is what got me hooked on documentaries was uh, Francis Ford Coppola's wife, who had made the documentary um, Hearts of Darkness, The Filmmaker's Apocalypse. And 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 to really put that right next to Apocalypse Now is is as great, if not greater in many areas, uh, really blew me away. So, so how did you end up heading down that documentary film path direction? Well, I never intended to. And in fact, I started making experimental films. My mm -hmm. first three films were short experimental films. I was deeply in love with the art of cinema. And yeah. you know, during my undergraduate years, I estimate I saw somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 films. And so those films for me formed the basic vocabulary of images that I could draw from for the rest of my life. In fact, uh, 
you know, cut to 25 years later, I'm making a fiction feature film uh, in the cornfields of Iowa. And I would tell my DP all the time, do you remember that shot from Werner Herzog's film, Casper Hauser? Yeah. <laughs> something like that. And, you know, so, you know, those images are all in there. So, uh, you know, I, I love fiction as well as doc. Yeah. And my perfect world, I would actually alternate year to year, make a fiction film, then a doc and so forth. Wow. But about 20, uh, well, actually, it's exactly 20 years ago. The 20 year anniversary of Warrior Films is next week. And it was at that time, 20 years ago, that I decided, you know what, I need to harness my artistic energies to my uh, interest in social welfare and social yeah. uh goodness. And so I started my nonprofit, Warrior Films. And that's when I really have been focusing almost exclusively on documentaries ever since, you know, trying to, as we say in our mission, bear witness and create yeah. change. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the films that is in your library or the, the five film series, Veterans Journey Home, I mean, that's that was produced through Warrior Films. And you took a, a, a different approach on telling some veteran stories. And can you share a little bit about how that all came to be? Because as a veteran, um, you know, the, the, the plight of the veteran community is, is heavy on my heart. And, and I always want to be a voice for our veteran community. So when I found out that you worked on this film series, it just blew me away. But what led to creating Veterans Journey Home? Yeah, well, and God bless you, too, for your concern. You know, your audience needs to first know I'm not a vet, okay? So my father was a World War II vet, but not my, I wasn't. So um, I was actually introduced to veterans issues by being invited to staff a weekend workshop outside of Houston called Vets Journey Home. And mm -hmm. this was way back in 2005. And that weekend blew my mind and it blew my heart open too, frankly, to see that uh, so many veterans, a lot of them were Vietnam vets, yeah. 30 plus years after the fact, were still living in so much torment. I, I thought this is crazy. Yeah. So I started reading up and I started learning more and more and more. And I read 20, 25 books or so about veterans transitioning into civilian life. And I thought, you know, we can make a contribution here. We can make a valuable one. And so I basically started filming what you might call rituals of return for veterans, because I think we could probably both agree that, you know, a clap on the back and a thank you handshake, you know, thank you for your service right. is not sufficient for vets. Right. And so, you know, we need something like reverse boot camp. You know, we're very good with boot camp and turning civilians into soldiers. We yeah. need something like that to turn them back into civilians. Sure. And yeah. so I started filming all of these beautiful processes across the country, very, very different from each other. And that's what became the five film series. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Some of the interviews you have in those those films, um, it's just a different perspective. You know, like when you have the, the service member sharing his experience and then the spouse sharing her experience when he returns home um you know, like, stating like you know this wasn't the man that i married he came home completely different and um you know all the benefits in the world aren't going to help you overcome that part so i agree with you i i love the idea of a reverse boot camp if you will and you know it's interesting for the longest times i mean the service members especially if they saw combat um, in most societies would have to go through some pretty extensive transitioning before you let them back in with, you know, the general population, if you will. Yes. Because um, it's very hard to turn all that off. Yes. Well, some of my best teachers in this work have studied indigenous traditions around the world. Yeah. And in fact, it's from those indigenous traditions that a lot of these practices uh, have been borrowed. Yeah. So, you know, uh, just to give your audience one example. So one of the films focuses on what is kind of a Native American style vision quest ceremony where 12 veterans gather in the desert of eastern Washington for a 12 day period. And in the middle of those 12 days for four days, they go off on a solo journey with just a backpack and four gallons of water and a sleeping bag. And that's it. 
And so they're not only alone, but they're fasting the entire time. And so it replicates, you know, to some degree, some of these indigenous rites of passage yeah. that have been going on on the planet for thousands of years. And then they come back and they share their stories. And then all of that helps get them reintegrated meaningfully back into civilian life. How has the feedback been from the veteran community or even the military spouse community after viewing this, this five-part film series? Oh, gosh, people love it. There's no question. It just breaks hearts wide open. Um, you know, we've won, I think at the last count, 11 different best documentary awards at festivals uh, for three of the films. Two of them I never even entered into festivals. Um, and and so, you know, people really respond very, very strongly. The challenge has been reaching people, getting them to see yeah. the work. And we actually wanted to partner, if we could, with the VA and even the Pentagon and whoever to try to basically get these films as part of a reintroduction into civilian life program. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't succeeded. Well, it's so important because you think about all of the troops that are transitioning out of that combat era from last 20 years of being in war. And I, and I think one of your films- 2.7 touched, million vets coming out of how many? Iraq, yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, it's so many, you know, it's, it's interesting because I do a lot of business coaching and when I'm, when I'm coaching on the transition from the pandemic into the, the great new era, right? So we're out of this phase. It was very much for a lot of people, like a, like a majorly long deployment, uh, socially distanced from each other. So there was all the dynamics of PTSD involved without going to combat, but they experienced different things. And Here's what's interesting. I always try and tell people, and, and I think your films capture it, the transitions can be the hardest part of the whole journey, just the, the, the mental side of it. And, and you would think veterans, you know, facing, you know, bombs and bullets and people trying to kill you and they face that obstacle. Then the idea of transitioning home, this has got to be the greatest time ever. And, and that's where all the signs of, you know, the challenges come out. And then it, hopefully they get to that next era. But you alluded to, the fact that there's still over 20 su veteran suicides a day in yes. our country. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, you know, and my, I, I really feel drawn to veterans. I, I Now I feel perhaps, you know, pretentiously, but that I have a real understanding and appreciation for wh what vets go through. And a lot of it has to do with crisis of identity. Uh, but really the way that I see it is they're stuck in the middle of an incomplete rite of passage. So, you know, they've got the first half or so of a traditional archetypal rite of passage, but yeah. they don't have the final stage of it. They don't have the ritualistic uh, uh, homecoming that they require in order to psychologically and emotionally transition back to civilian life. So at any rate, um, that's that's what the series focuses on. And it's all very positive stories, although, you know, they go through the, the trenches to get there. Yeah. How was it for you as a filmmaker, as you're, you know, as you're documenting this, were you shocked at some of the stories that you heard? Because you have an idea, right? You, you always have an idea going in, the questions that you're going to ask, maybe what some of the responses were. But at, at some point, were you, was the camera rolling and you were like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. Well, that did happen, and it happened for me most dramatically when we were filming a four-month meditation mindfulness-based retreat with 22 women veterans. Mm. So, uh, you know, so I had already worked with veterans for a number of years, but not so intensively with women. And yeah. to hear the stories that those women told, those were absolutely hair-raising and and so heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as as horrible as a lot of the male veterans stories are, and I don't want to diminish them in any way. Mm -hmm. The women's stories were off the charts, even worse. Wow. You just never saw you almost never see that coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We've actually started documenting, you know, or we have a foundation. So we award scholarships to military spouses. So as part of that, we want to become a voice for them. Because right. they face some challenges people don't think about daily. And we've started documenting some of the military spouse stories. And some of them 
come out of the blue and hit you, hit you right in the face on how challenging it is. And, you know, it's just, it, I, I feel compelled like you do just to bring an awareness to that community. Yeah. Well, and it's so true. You know, the women and children often have their own PTS and yeah. it often goes completely unrecognized, unacknowledged, and of course, unhealed. Yeah. So, you know, and it's interesting though, too, you know, you mentioned COVID and yeah. how in a sense we've all been through this collective rite of passage for the last That's three right. years. Right. And, That's right. and, and, and I actually write about it in my second book. It's the last chapter. It's called COVID-19 and our planetary rite of passage. So you know, it's just, I just mentioned that partly in case your, uh, your readers are interested. Uh, I know they, they will be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I 100% know they will be, Frederick, because ever since the pandemic broke out, that was a topic that I was discussing. As I said, you know, and I took it from a veteran standpoint. I said, you know, there's going to be certain phases to this chaos that we're facing you know you could call chaos combat or cancer or covid and there's there's always three phases there's the obstacle it's what we face and then there's the transition out of it and then there's the new era that you live in and you know we're in the new era but everybody's transitioning at different rates right now and and that was the interesting part is that people transitioned at different rates based on where they lived based on where they worked based on their families and so there was there was not a lot of unity on this one. And, and I often say that, you know, those stay at home orders, it was almost like a long deployment for people where they couldn't yes. see their loved ones. And, yes. they, and they were even told you can't go see mom and dad right now or grandma and grandpa. So exactly. Um, but again, it's just, you know, I always say it's PTSD, it's stress disorder, not combat or war or, or deployment disorder. And so we all face that together. So we do have that shared camaraderie that comes out of that experience. But it was interesting, like you were saying, they need to go through that rite of passage. There was no, after COVID, it was just, all right, send everybody back to work. <laughs> it's like, what could go wrong? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. you know, we weren't thinking of all the, I mean, we talk, we talk a lot about mental health, but I don't think we thought about how many people actually had it as a result of the, the pandemic and, and all the other variables mixed in there. Yeah. Well, you know, there's multiple factors that sort of alerted me to the fact that this was in, in effect a rite of passage and mm -hmm. planetary. And one of them, interestingly enough, is the three phases that you just allude to that you mentioned, because those are the three archetypal phage, phases of rite of passage. Yeah. First comes separation, separation from all that you know and are familiar with, and, yeah. and, and being isolated and in effect locked down is the most extreme form of that, right? And then right. comes the ordeal, uh, otherwise often known as the, the transitional phase, the liminal phase. We're in a twi twilight zone. Am I in the past? In the future? Where am I? Yeah. And then there has to be that homecoming. And the interesting thing, though, too, is that a lot of people understood implicitly they never use this formulation of rites of passage, any of this, but they started to call their identities into question. What am I doing with my life? And that right. is a fundamental byproduct of rite of passage. That's yeah. essential. So you have to, in effect, recontextualize yourself, redefine yourself. And that's what a lot of people have done. You know, it's so interesting because... <clears throat> In the military, there's there's heavy forms of identity, right? Semper Fi and be all you can be. And, you know, you're a soldier, you're a Marine, you're, you're an airman or a sailor and all of these things. So there's so much identity when you're in. And then when you get out, to a certain extent, you, you're still always a part of that organization, but you do lose a sense of that identity. And, yes. and it's so interesting because during and the COVID, camaraderie. Yeah. All that brotherhood, the sisterhood, that family. And, and during during the pandemic, it was interesting when you look at that three year period. All these everybody started to here's how I identify, you know, here identity became a hot topic. And, and to a certain extent, yes, we trying to figure out who am I through all of this? Yes, and, and that's that's not uncommon for veterans to come home afterward and say, you know, who am I now? Exactly. You know? And one of the key factors of that, particularly with veterans, is they need a new sense of mission, yes. right? Because you're all given that mission of service, right? Yeah. And if nothing else, it's your commanding officers. But you know, ideally, it's the Constitution, That's right? Right. They That's need that what, purpose. 
they need that purpose. And so when they get out, it's like, what is my purpose? So that's the common factor of all of these beautiful rituals of return that we filmed is that they help uh, the veterans to identify a unique yeah. purpose to them, to their life, because yes. that's where it has to come from. It, it can't come from above. It has that's to right. come from within. I think that's incredible. I, I think that you're your film series is just absolutely, I, I hope everybody listening watches it and shares it. They need to. Um, we have millions and millions of veterans. So it's it's not like a small population out there. Um, there the, you know, there's over 2 million people currently serving, but when you add up all the veterans from years past, there's just tens of millions of veterans out there. So I'm talking about a huge population that I like how you phrase it, really never finished that cycle. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yep. Um, yeah. And I think we're very much going to see the long-term effects of, of, you know, those combat years and people transitioning home, just like we will the COVID years and people transitioning back into some sort of normalcy again, that they have to redefine. So maybe yeah. there's a future, future film in there about COVID-19 that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you got no shortage of people to interview. Everybody was impacted, you know? Well, in a sense, the, the film that I am working on now is partly a byproduct of COVID-19 because you know, one of the offshoots of COVID-19 was that sense of separation, right? And yeah. so many of us had loved ones who were dying That's that right. we literally couldn't even see. We couldn't even get in the same room in the hospital with them to say our goodbyes, right? And how heartbreaking is that? And so, you know, it started me reflecting again on the process of death and dying in our society. You know, there's so much denial about it, period, in general. Yeah. But I thought, you know, we need to do what it was that we actually did for my late wife seven years ago. And it turned out to be 12 days before she died of breast cancer that we held a life honoring celebration for her. And we had all of her extended family and friends and community all in one room together. And one after another, people stood up in the front of the room right next to her and said, Tracy, here's how you made a difference in my life. I'm a better person because of you. And here's what you did. And I think everybody deserves that. Nobody deserves to leave this lifetime without any sense of the ripples of impact that we've yeah. all made on each other. So how long have you been working on that? Because you're, you're referring to it's your wonderful life. Yes. First of all, I've, great, great title, by the way. <laughs> well, I've just recently started it. So we're just at the beginning process. You know, we filmed a couple of these life honoring yeah. celebrations, but I want to film many more. And, you know, again, I'm agnostic about modality. I don't care what religion it is. I yeah. don't care what the structure of the event is. I don't care. I just want people to be honored and loved before they pass because to do it when they're dead and in the ground during funerals makes no sense to me. Right. How, what, so what was the, what was the main factor in coming up with this, this idea for this film? Cause first of all, I think I, it's wonderful. I think well, it's, I've I, heard, yeah. it too. I've, I first saw it modeled for me uh, from a man who was in my men's group in Chicago. Uh, it was in 2005 and he was dying of cancer and so the men in his circle put together this kind of a celebration for him. And it was just beautiful. We had over 100 people in the room. He had his mother, uh, his mother, his wife on one side, <laughs> his son on the other, his nine-year-old son, who he knew he would never see to grow into an adult man. And so person after person stepped forward in the room and just loved on Marty and said, here's how you made a difference, myself included. And then he also had people phoning in, calling in from around the country, who people who couldn't be there. And person after person, here's how you made a difference for me. So if nothing else, his son got a deep sense on that very day of who his father really was, what his standing was in the community, and something that could live on in him at a kind of a cellular level to take into his adulthood with him. Because his father died within the year. Oh, that and and for that young boy, that'll be something he will never forget. Yep, I think that's incredible. I do you have a, uh, a kind of a estimated release date for this film? 
I wish, but these films <laughs> typically take three to four years. <laughs> yeah. I can't even say at this point, but you know, we do have a two minute teaser that um, you know, I'd be happy to share, you know, with your viewers, whether it's live now or whether it's offline some later time. Oh, I would love that. In fact, when we air this show, because we're we're just recording it right now, but when we air it, we can we can add that link in there too. I would Great. love to help promote that. You know, it's interesting because you kind of touched down on in our society, I think in America, we kind of ignore death different in such a different way than other societies do. We're I'm not saying to embrace it. I'm saying to deal with it differently. I, well, I feel frankly, like I think there's nothing wrong with embracing it. I mean, yeah. the fact is we're all coming to this end. We all know it, but we yeah. act as if we don't believe it, right? right. We like don't if we don't it. if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. Exactly. That somehow it'll go away and it doesn't go away. And it and it and it can happen at any time. I always say death doesn't arrive with a save the date notice, right? And I have a dear friend right now who's facing the possible death of his nine-year-old son who has terrible brain tumors. So, you know, it can happen at any time for any of us. So the point is, if we understand, if, if we can turn death into an ally, which is actually what happened to me, and actually that's my, what my first book is about, escorting my late wife to her own death, and then my journey through the grief afterwards. If we can be intimate and familiar with it and not be fearful of it, it can be an ally for our lives. You know, it's so interesting because the fact that you brought that up, I have a client who is a realtor and she experienced death suddenly and from a car accident, her, I think it was her ex-fiance had been killed. And so it happened very quickly. And, and she made a life altering decision to become a death doula. So I don't know if you're familiar with those, but. Oh, absolutely. No, I, well, I am heard. now because <laughs> I wasn't, but I am now. And, yep. and now I, I'm actually beginning a coaching program for her for the next 90 days as she gets her business off of the ground and, and helps get this message out there to people that there are death doulas out there that can help guide them through the process. And I still have a lot to learn about it. But I was completely fascinated by it, um, yeah, yeah. and it and it's so needed. Well, and you know, I um, as an aside, you know, I've been a, a practicing uh, Buddhist for about thirty years. You know, okay. meditation. Yeah. And so I'm an ordained Zen priest, and part of my ministry is ministering to the dead and dying, or the death. You know, those who are dying and those yeah. who are grieving the dead. You know, so, so you, you've been down that pathway. You do that. What the death doulas do then? Exactly. Yeah. And I actually love it, you know, because, you know, if, if people could just get over their fears about it, they would realize there's so many gifts to harvest right. at end of life times. You wow. know, the intimacy, the authenticity, the love is just unsurpassed. And we actually have the capacity as human beings to be awake and learning up until that final moment when we actually transition out of this lifetime. And that's what I want to be. I want to be awake and learning going, oh my God, yeah. I, want to, I want to experience this adventure of dying. I mean, talk about in, uh, harnessing up a whole new perspective on this. Yeah. But, but also the peace of mind that must come with having that perspective too. Exactly. I don't in fear. fear death, you know, at all, like I used to. Yeah. Yeah. So Warrior Films, you started it wait, almost 20 years ago. Yep. And what, what, obviously this film will be inside of that, that library of amazing films, but what other type of goals do you have within Warrior Films or the filmmaking community or just in general? Like what else are you working on? Because you seem well, to have a lot of plates spinning. <laughs> I do. But, you know, a lot of them tie directly back to Rites of Passage, which has been a real key theme for my entire life. So, you know, my TV mini series is all about 15 and 16 year old boys. It's called Boys to Men question mm. mark. And I was absolutely obsessed for years with how teenage boys are transitioning into young adulthood and what structures of community support are there to support them in that effort. And, you know, so back in the day, you know, we used to have initiation 
We used right, to have right. mentorship, right? That was built into community structures. In fact, there's an African proverb that says, if we do not initiate the young, they will burn down the village to feel the heat. Mm. Well, what? Look around. There's a lot of teens that are burning down villages yes. because they're not being initiated and mentored, right? That's right. So, so that's what that series. But anyway, all of my films, to some degree, including the veteran series, and then, of course, this transition into death is yeah. also about rite of passage. Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating because I, I remember when I first started in college, I went to a junior college after the Marine Corps and I took a um, I took a course. And and one of the instructors was talking about that, that that rite of passage, that every society has always had that. And and to a certain extent, especially around the young boys turning into men and how to even harness some of that power and, and control some of that. She would call it the raw male energy. So it didn't, didn't do bad things. <laughs> so exactly. you, you can feel it. And I, and I feel very much like you said, the, the whole boot camp process, that initiation is, is a rite of passage and something that lives with you. I mean, I, I left the Marine Corps in 1991. I was honorably discharged as a corporal. I served for four years. There's not a day that goes by I don't speak to a Marine. And, and that was 30 plus years ago. And yep. somehow it'll come up, even if I hear an Ura or a Semper Fi somewhere. Um, there's this bond that happens with these rites of passages too. I think they're 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 necessary. I think that they help forge you for the rest of your life. Yep. Well, you know, you mentioned teen boys, and I I find it really heartbreaking that as a society. These days, it seems like we've lost our capacity to know and understand teen boys' behavior. And so yeah. we try to curtail it. We try to stamp it down. And that is not a healthy thing to do. This is normal adolescent behavior. You know, they have hormones popping through their pores, right? right? So what we want to do is harness it and direct it, right? Yeah. We And we want to actually, in effect, bless them into... Uh, places where they can sort of uh, assume their place in the community of adults and right. then actually share the gifts that are unique to those individuals because we as a community, as a village, need them. And That's so right. when, we're, when we're not actually initiating and mentoring teens, we're also cutting off the future of our own communities. And you can see it happening so much, especially in the inner cities. Yeah, you know, it's just they're 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 so ignored. I've I've wanted to do a lot in the inner cities too. I putting together a program called Inner Greatness. They still got to flush some things out. Might take a few years too, but you know it's it's interesting. You hear certain things like you hear people talk for years about helping the inner cities, helping the inner cities, and you and I know there's some help going on, but you don't see a lot of the results. And so I'm like, all right, there, there's got to be a better way. And and even with the teen boys, like you were saying. I, I listened to this this educator and she was saying how boys, they even learn differently. You know, they're going to be interested in different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, their style on learning, we they're, they were trying to compress them into this little box that if you can behave here, um, <clears throat> and yet these boys are just kind of exploding and, you know, maybe they don't want to read Little Women, but they want to read X-Men. <laughs> you know, I mean, so... And, the, and there's a different way of learning. And I'm not saying that Little Women is not a bad book or X-Men is a, is a, you know, super novel, but... Um, it is no, interesting. We, yeah, we have to respect those differences and in, in how they learn and and how they go through their rites of passage. Exactly. Yeah, we we know these things now. Boys learn better when they're physically engaged. You know, yeah. they need to get up and walk around the classroom. They can't sit at a desk all day long. Girls are much better for that. You know, they're physiologically yeah. better attuned for that kind of learning. So yeah. there's all kinds of differences like that that we have to be more sensitive to. Well, it was like in boot camp. We still had to attend class, which which was a huge letdown for me. When I left high school and I went into boot camp, all of a sudden now I'm in Marine Corps classes. I'm like, this is worse than high school. But they never kept you in those classes more than an hour. Then you were either getting punished or you're outside doing push-ups. Uh, they just get it. I mean, they got it. And the amount of retention that we had in order to pass boot camp. I mean, just thinking about what you're talking about, Frederick, with getting around and moving, you weren't really at rest too long in the in, in boot camp. 
But even when we went to classes, you know, 30 or 45 minutes perhaps, and then bam, you're out doing a run. And, and I look back and I'm blown away at how much knowledge we retained during that time period. You yep. know, so there's an obstacle course, then a class, then you're learning yep. about your rifle, then there's a class, then you're getting busted and you're doing push ups, then there's a class. So, those, yeah, those are ideal learning modalities for, in particular, boys, teen yeah. boys. Yeah, interesting. So, so what's ahead then for Warrior Films? And I know you mentioned that it's a nonprofit. Yes. So, how I would love to help you get the word out there. For starters, I got my new book coming out called um, Unleash Your Business Warrior. So, I love the word. I, I, I love the warrior. So, as soon as I saw Warrior Films, I'm like, I'm in, I'm watching all of the, anything you're making. But, what's how how are you fundraising for for warrior films right now are you just is it a grassroots movement or at least maybe when it started or how are you finding your contributors well you know there there's multiple ways i mean we have a board and then the board undertakes certain fundraising responsibilities uh, we also have massive uh, ground level grassroots outreach. So we also, you know, solicit people to just be $10 a month donors, you know, to yeah. what we do. But we also, you know, we're professional filmmakers. So we look for broadcasters and distributors who want to carry our work and then take it out to a greater public. So, you know, we're always looking for deals to basically, um, license all of yeah. the films that we have in our library so all of those things that's great i would love to help spread the word i'm I'm very blessed i still work in the broadcast capacity i get to go around the country and speak at a, for a lot of associations and and one of the ones i do a lot with is the uh, the broadcasters associations in each of the different states so i'm going to be sure to pass your information along to them because the story your your style of storytelling and the stories that you're telling are extremely compelling. I mean, just absolutely amazing. You know, there's there's great movies out there. There's not so great movies. There's great documentaries, not so great. Yours are up there in that great category. And that's why I was so excited that you said to be on the show today. Um, let me let me ask you this. You've you've experienced some challenges, obviously, with your wife. I, my wife has had health issues and, um, you know, we're passionate about what we do. If somebody's listening right now that maybe they have some challenges, some, some some roadblocks they're facing, and they just want to get their their life or their career heading in a new direction, do you have any advice for them, somebody facing challenges today? Well, it's interesting. I think there's multiple levels of support, right? And I think you can think of them as like the rings of an onion, you know, and at the center, you know, there's the individual. And then the immediate circle, it has to be what I would call our own container of self-support. I consider myself a high maintenance individual. You know, if I don't get up and, and, and meditate every day and do my prayers and exercise, stretching, uh, all of it, uh, then I'm in trouble. So yeah. I, have the, you know, that's my self container. And then yeah. the next layer out, there has to be community, right? Yeah. And so I have uh, my weekly men's support group that I meet with that is indispensable for me. And I've been doing it for 27 years. I love it. Uh, and I've done it actually in many different places, not only around the country, but literally around the world. So, the, and then there's all these other communities that I'm a member of. So that's that's another key ingredient, especially difficult for many of us men, is asking yeah. for help, asking for help, Agreed. saying, listen, I need some help around this, that, and the other, because I consider aloneness to be the male disease. And if we're not living in deep connection, not only with our immediate families, but with these communities, we can get in trouble. And then our Agreed. mind starts spinning and telling us all kinds of negative things about who we are and about our lives. And in fact, we don't get all of that positive reinforcement and support that we deserve. I I love that. I think just having different layers of support is so essential, not relying on just one like yourself or even this group, but multiple different groups within your community. You know, I I think that what you're doing is is absolutely phenomenal. Your zest for life and for supporting and helping misunderstood or, or 
disadvantaged communities is just so remarkable, Frederick. I mean, I'm just, um, <clears throat> I'm blown away. I, I speak to you and I say, I have to, I have to do more good in the world. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, so I am, uh, very I am kind of you to say, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, in the wake of all the success I had with Hoop Dreams, going to the Academy Awards, the Emmy Awards, all of this stuff, you know, somebody said to me a few years later, why aren't you in Hollywood and why aren't you making more films and uh, in, in that context? And I said, you know, I, I, I took a good hard look at my life and what I'm here on the planet to do. And I think it's about using that art and harnessing it for social good. Yeah. And that's what I really want to do. I want to tell stories that'll move people to change their own lives, to try to reach for the greatest beings they can be. I just, I, I think that, you know, like we talked about with the military and them coming back, you found your purpose. And when you find your purpose, it, you know, there's, there's so much peace in that and, and, and excitement and enthusiasm every day. You know, I'm, I'm excited for our audience to be exposed to your films that I'm really excited about. Um, so if, if somebody wants to get a, in touch with you or, or find out more about warrior films and all the great films they can watch right now or upcoming films what's the best way to reach out to you well the website is warriorfilms.org and on that website you'll find many 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 things uh including our store so you'll find awesome. at least 15 of the films that i've made over the last 45 years they're there you'll find all three of my books they're there or at least links to them are there and you'll also find ways that you yourself, if you're interested, can join with us. We always need partners and support. You know, you can even join our board if you're really interested. So, um, so that's all up on the site. And, and there's a lot of other resources there too. In a sense, all of my short films, I give away. They're yeah. all over the site. You can just go there and watch the short films to your heart's content. The longer films I try to monetize. Yeah. At any rate, there's an awful lot there. So please help yourself. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to be head. I've, I've got it pulled up right here. So I'm going to be watching some more movies. And I know our audience is going to be watching movies. So I'm sure you're going to be getting some amazing feedback from them. And um, maybe we'll have you back on once you finish up your next project. You know, it's your wonderful life. I'm very excited to see that. I, I think there's such a need for that new perspective on life and death that you're going to bring to everybody. So Frederick, well, I just, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, and I'm just going to say, I do want to share the two minute teaser with your audience. And yes. I just want to let them know in advance that who you're seeing in there is my late wife. So we filmed her life honoring celebration. And again, it was 12 days before she died. And that's the raw material that I used for this teaser for this film. So you'll see me in there and you'll see her in there. I cannot, I cannot wait to take a look at that and to share it with our audience. And just thank you so much for not only just being on the show, but being so open and giving us a new perspective. You know, I think that perception is reality. And I think you just impacted everybody's reality today. So thank you. <laughs> well, my pleasure. Blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frederick.